song is an anthem for right now. Take courage, be strong. Remember where your help comes from. I've got to tell you, church, what is happening in our world today is no surprise to our God. He is enthroned and He is mighty and He is empowering and He is strengthening His people to be the answer, not to be part of the problem, not to be thrown around with all the craziness that's going on, but to be the light in the darkness. So we honour you, we honour you, we honour you, Mikey, leading the charge. Um, so good. Riley Brosnahan, what a song. That was amazing. So good. Beautiful Lisa, all the team. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, you are released. You are released. And our youth, have fun. Have fun out there hanging out with one another around the Word of God. So inspiring. So good. Amazing. How are we all? Shout out to everyone online. Great to see you. I saw a few people already chatting on our online forum. Hey, Nat and Dee, I know you guys are away this weekend, but watching online and saw some other people on there. Hello. So great to have you all with us. And for all of you that are present, yay, yay. How good is it to come together in the presence of God? It is amazing. Wonderful. Well, we are in our series, Masterpiece, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> it's everywhere. And I love our Vision Builders video. Thank you, Nathan Cox, for that amazing script. You were the writer, weren't you? He was the writer. He was the writer. That's an incredible script and just a beautiful articulation of God's heart for us. And what an inspiring video. So exciting. And I just feel that I have a word this morning based around this theme. Hey, Jack, can see you up the back in your French Renaissance masterpiece theme. You're looking beautiful. Um, I feel like God has given me a word this morning really just a, around this theme. And I feel like he wants us to remember. And the word remember is an interesting word. It's kind of like the more we remember, the more we're remembering the broken parts of who we are. And the more we remember what God has said about us and who we are in Christ, the more healing God does in us individually and corporately. Hey, Grace, 
Lovely to have you visiting today. Sorry, I just like to connect with everyone. And so I feel like today the word I'm bringing is to help you remember. And it is based around our key scripture for this theme, which is from Ephesians 2.10. The scripture is, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And so kind of the heart's cry of this morning's message is with all that's happening in our world and the uncertainty around us, and we certainly are in uncertain times, I feel like the Spirit of God is saying to us as His people, we are not pawns in a big cosmic puzzle being thrown around with everything's going on, who knows what's going to happen but we are actually his answer in the midst of all that's happening. I was praying on Thursday morning with some of the women in our church. We hold a Zoom meeting Thursday mornings and women gather and I was actually praying for our youth and the burden of that word came upon my heart. Like I felt for the youth of this generation growing up in a world that who knows what's happening next. And I felt like God say no. They are not pawns, Kiralee. They are the answer. I am raising up answers. I am raising up answers through my people. I am raising up answers through my church. You are an answer. God's answer to darkness was to create. Right back in the beginning of the world, right back in the beginning, the earth In the book of Genesis, we read Genesis chapter 1, we read that the earth was formless and void. Hey, Elena, are you following me up there on screens? I've just jumped to scripture. I'll go back to it. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light. And there was light. In the midst of darkness, God spoke and he created. And we know he created light, he created darkness, he created the land, he created the sea, he created plants, he created animals. And the pinnacle of God's creation, his masterpiece in his creation was you and I, men and women, mankind. God created goes on to verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they might rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God's answer to a formless and void, dark and uncertain universe was to create. And at the pinnacle of his creation was you and I, his masterpiece. People in Christ are not the problem, they are the answer. Your life is not the problem, your life is the answer for the times that we're living in. Let's go back to the dictionary definition of masterpiece. There was one definition on that Vision Builders video, which I quite liked actually, but I must have looked at a different dictionary. (laughs) Okay, so dictionary.com defines masterpiece as a person's greatest piece of art. No, a a person's greatest piece of work as in an art. Anything done with masterly skills, a masterpiece, e.g. a masterpiece of improvisation, a consummate example of skill or excellence of any kind, e.g. the chef's cake was a masterpiece. So incredible. I love this definition because it's like you and I are God's ultimate work, his masterpiece in creation. And I kind of think of it in terms of a chess game as well. Like there's all these pawns buzzing around, but then there's these masterpieces that win the game, that seal the deal. And that is you and I, the masterpiece of God's creation. 
The Passion Translation uh, for Ephesians 2.10 is we have become his poetry. It's another translation of this word workmanship, masterpiece. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Isn't that beautiful? And you, if you actually study the Bible in more, de- in more depth, then I encourage you to do that. There's so many tools online. I, purposely, I personally like Bible Hub when I'm going a little bit deeper or Bible Gateway. But if you go into that word workmanship masterpiece, the Greek word is poeme. And it is the word from where we get poem. In fact, Tim said to me when he asked me to preach this morning, come on, honey, you're a poet. Masterpiece is about poetry. Like you really need to preach this morning. And I'm like, all right. And some of you know, I do write a lot of poetry. It's a way that I bring expression to what God is teaching me. And I've actually in this season, this year, I've completed my first kind of adult manuscript, I've written children's books and authored a number of books. Some of you have them. But this year I've been working on a manuscript for women and it's, it's full of poetry. And it's in its final stages of editing. And I managed to find an editor who actually focuses on editing poetry. And we were chatting on the phone the other day before she receives the manuscript. And she said, you know, Kiralee, It's very different editing poetry. It takes a long time because every single line is heavily considered and thought through. Every word has significance in its placement and the weight and emphasis it's given. And it's true. I've heard it said that poetry is concentrated language, potent language. And as a poet, that speaks to me because I can spend days on one page of poetry, maybe four verses of poetry, as I really contemplate and meditate on what word goes where to have the desired effect. I really don't wanna have any words that are unnecessary. I really don't wanna include any lines that particularly repeat themselves unless it's so important to get the message across. Like I am, really waiting on God to get the right placement of the right word in the right spot for maximum achievement. Now, if as a human flawed poet, I give that much attention, time and focus to the way my poetry is put together for it to hit its mark, to the way each word is placed to pierce the hearts of the reader. How much more attention has the author and the finisher of your faith and your life put on you as his masterpiece? How much more focus has he put on where every gift is placed? where every part of your, how your personality is formed together, how your wiring is made, where you are placed in time to be an answer. God is the master craftsman. He is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. And he took nine months perhaps 10, if you had children like mine that like to stay in the womb, nine months to 10 months to ponder and create and knit together who you are in your mother's womb. Psalm 139, many of you know the scripture. Psalm 139 is King David kind of waking up to the revelation of the mastery of God's workmanship over our individual lives. He's waking up to it and his spoken words that have now been preached throughout the world and will continue to be preached throughout eternity. And these are his words, Psalm 139 verse 13. For you created my inmost being, O God, 
You're not an accident. You are not an accident. You've got to remember or you end up broken. You have to remember what God says about you or you end up purposeless and messy on the ground. You are not an accident. You, he created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. No matter the circumstances of your birth, you may be a child of horrific violence. You may be a child of abuse. You may be a child of parents who didn't love each other, of parents that broke up. I, I don't, I, I do care, by the way, <laughs> about the circumstances, but I am here to proclaim a word that is greater and more powerful and more eternal than any natural circumstance surrounding your birth. And that word is, it was God who knit you together in your mother's womb. It was God who was intimately involved in your creation. It was God who sovereignly ordained that you would be placed into the womb and sent to this earth for such a time as this, as His poem, concentrated language for purpose, for plan to make a mark on the earth. Let's continue. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now that is an incredible scripture. If we can get a hold of that scripture, that is going to transform us and position us for the days to come. Your days were ordained before one of them was yet to be. God knit you together fearfully and wonderfully and purposely for such a time as this to be His answer, to be His masterpiece not thrown around with all that's happening, not with an uncertain future, no, with days ordained by the master craftsman for his purpose and for his plan in the age that we live in. Amen. So good. Your life is an answer. You've been made for a purpose. My second point is the workmanship is not yet over. The master is still at work in and through your life. Yes, he knit us together in our mother's womb. He created us. But there comes a point, people, where we give our life and we yield to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we become a recreated person. The Bible says a completely new creation recreated in Him. And from that point where our life is given to Christ, God is continually at work to form us, to shape us, to mold us into the image of His Son. We were created once in His womb, but we are forever being recreated, formed and molded on planet Earth. And so I want to encourage people here today who think, well, I've stuffed up my life. I've stuffed up my purpose. Well, I can tell you right now, the master craftsman has not finished with your story. The master craftsman is still at work. He is like the master potter. And we are like the pots on the potter's wheel. We're continually being shaped molded, chipped away at. Sometimes it is incredibly uncomfortable as God challenges our human pride and our human thoughts and wants us to be soft and tender like Him. Sometimes it's, exci it's exciting as God just throws water on the wheel and says, here you go, here's some water from heaven. I'm gonna make this process a little easier. Sometimes it's wonderful because He's using us as His pots. He's pouring out water through us. But we are continually being molded and shaped by God. 
So a few points, one, I've mentioned it, we're recreated when we come to Christ. So for those new to the kingdom of God, and I know there's a few of you being water baptised today, which is so exciting, such a celebration. I am so excited for you because this is the start of a new creation life. The old goes under the waters of baptism, the Bible says, and we come up in resurrection life with Jesus Christ. And it is a new day where we live out of a new nature, the image of Christ in us, and it's very exciting. So we become, we're recreated when we come to Christ. Even if we've yielded our life to Christ, but we've come to a place where we feel so broken, so smashed, so much like we've failed and God has finished with us. He just hasn't. In fact, God has this uncanny love for broken pieces. He's kind of attracted to brokenness. And if you're thinking, are you sure about that, Kiralee? Well, let me just remind you of what Stephen declared when he first got up this morning. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, the first scripture he preached, it's on our back wall, it's the Spirit of the Lord God is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Good news comes to the poor people, not to those who are already rich. He's anointed me, he's sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, not bind up those whose hearts are all together. The Psalms are very clear. Psalm 34, 18, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So if you're here today saying, there is no way I can be the answer, there's no way that I can be God's masterpiece because I'm too break, broken. Well, I'm sorry, but that does not disqualify you because God is close to you in your brokenness and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And like the master artist, he takes the broken pieces and he pours water on them and he makes them soft and malleable again in his hands. And then he starts to mold and remold for his purpose. God is never finished. He's always at work. He is ever patient. He's a beautiful artist. And, and that, I just want to make that point actually about artistry. True artistry requires great patience and great vision. You have to see a finished product and work through a completely unformed, messy, kind of disjointed period of time before you get to that place. As a writer, I know this to be true. <laughs> I've kind of got this finished product of what I want to communicate but the process of getting there, it's so unformed and it's so disjointed and it requires patience, love and labour <laughs> to take the messy, broken bits and bring forth the vision. Now, my patience is human patience, but God's patience is infinite. And some of you, some of us here today need to know that God is ever patient. His love is patient. The first quality of love in 1 Corinthians 13 is that it's patient, long-suffering. And the master craftsman is patient and long-suffering with your life that he may bring forth his vision that he saw right from the moment that you were in your mother's womb. He saw the vision. He saw the days ordained for you. And he is patient and long-suffering in bringing that masterpiece to life. He will continue what he's, he will continue and complete what he started. Philippians 1.6, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced that the one who began this glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful people. What he started in you, he will complete. 
until Christ can be seen in and through your life. And that is the ultimate aim of the master craftsman. It's to chisel away at our humanity like the sculptor who takes the block of stone and chisels, chisels, chisels until this beautiful form emerges. God's, what God does is chisel away at us, work away at us until the image of Christ is seen in and through our life. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches, he talked about laboring like a mother in labor until Christ was formed in the people. And that is a lifetime work. And one of the things that maybe we don't preach enough uh, in our church is the process of spiritual formation, the process of growth. We can often focus on where we're going and our destination and what God has for us and, you know, the blessings he has for us. And he does want to bless us and he is good. And there are great and precious promises in his word for us to hold on to. But do you know what his masterpiece is? It's Christ being formed in you. It's the formation of Christ in you. It's spiritual formation. And yes, he will take us through tough times to bring forth Jesus in us. He is more interested in the character of Christ coming through our life than he is in our personal comfort. That's an uncomfortable truth, but it's true. <laughs> we might as well get it. We might as well learn it because it's true. He's more interested in Christ being seen in and through your life than our, your comfort. That is the masterpiece he is at work. He is forming is Christ. Now, just as a little takeaway key, it's not in my notes. If you're up for this process, if you've signed up, <laughs> and believe me, if you've given your life to Christ, that's really what you're signing up for. You're signing up for Christ being formed in you. The key quality to make this process as easy as possible <laughs> and as less painful <laughs> as possible and as quick as possible is humility. It's humility. That's just an added extra in today's message. No matter how far you've gone in the Christian journey, you have not come off the potter's wheel until we enter heaven. And to stay yielded to the work of God and to stay in the process of what God is doing in our lives, it requires a continual posture of humility. Actually, I love what Jeff said to me just before the service. We were chatting about the uncertain times that we're living in. And, and Jeff Simpson said to me, you know, I just believe more than ever that God is calling his church to repentance so a new move of God can come in. And this is exactly what I'm talking about, church, that we would move from what we're going after, what we want, what we're offended about, what we're not happy about, to a yielded posture, here we go, on our knees, surrendered and repentant before God. And repentance is simply a turning back to God. It's not a, oh, I'm terrible, God. No, it's a turning back to God. It's a turning, it's repent, to turn, 180 degree turn back to God. It's a repentance and a turning. We turn to him. And from that place of yielded surrender on our knees, God begins to pour out his spirit, to do his work, to pour out that water we so desperately need to be molded in his presence, to be transformed into the image of Christ. And you know, that's the beauty about the craftsmanship of God. It's not just all chiseling, 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 truth, 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 this scripture, that scripture, oh my gosh, this is hammering me. Yes, that, that happens. But there's measureless grace. There's grace, there's grace, there's grace. There's waters of refreshing in the presence of God. There's rivers of God that flow through the church to bring joy to his people. We're being molded with word and spirit, people. Don't despair because the word's hitting hard against you. Let it do its work and let the Spirit come and refresh you and revive you and replenish you. 
The craftsman uses his word as a chisel and he uses water to refresh and revive and fill us to overflowing with his presence. Let his measureless grace come upon you. If you're in a hard place in your life and you're struggling to hold on to the promises, you're struggling to keep believing, ask God. Let his grace come. Get on your knees and ask for more grace. God, I need grace for this situation. Let your grace be sufficient for me. Pour out your grace. There's grace for your problem. There's grace for your hard place. There's grace for your impossible. There's grace for your today. There's grace for your tomorrow. There's grace for your family situation. There's grace for your broken relationship. There's grace for your wounds. There's grace and more grace because Christ took it all. He took it all. He took the wounds. He took the pain. He took the discord. He took the sin. He took the ugliness. He took the blackness so we could have a move of His Spirit come upon our lives, His grace and love to overshadow us. I loved the line in that song that we sang earlier. Fix your mind on this one thing. God is madly in love with you. If in the midst of it all, we understood that God is madly in love with us and His grace is being poured out upon us. So God will finish the work he started in us and it is the image of Christ in us. Point three, a masterpiece is bit to be displayed. I wanna tell you a story about the Sistine Chapel. Many of you will know it. For centuries and centuries, it was thought that Michelangelo's work was kind of made and designed with muted colours, toned down colours. That was until... I think a couple of decades ago, some cleaners and restorationists got into the Sistine Chapel and really started to clean away some of the dirt that had built up over this creation of Michelangelo's. They discovered that all the smoke of religion that had gone up over all the years, the smoke in the candles of the cathedral, had actually caused soot to discolour the vibrancy of Michelangelo's work. They discovered that just dirt and pollution had discolored the vibrancy of Michelangelo's work. And as they began to wash off this dirt, the pollution, the soot of smoke and religion, they discovered these vibrant, amazing colors. They discovered that his portrait of God and man and creation was so vibrant and full of colour. And I love this picture. And it, it kind of speaks to us as God's masterpiece. Sometimes our lives can get polluted. It can get polluted by religion, routine, going through the motions, In this Catholic cathedral, it was candles and the routine of lighting the candles and the smoke and the incense. In our lives, it can just be routine. And sometimes the colour can get dulled through our religious performance. And God is wanting to come along with the waters of His Word and clean us and revive us and refresh us so the beauty and colour inside of us can be put on display. Sometimes it's the dirt of the world. Maybe a few too many movies that are a little bit, you know, dicey. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Maybe it's, you know, stuff we're involved in that's a bit edgy, kind of polluting our spirits a little bit, making us a bit dirty. Maybe what we're watching online, we're getting drawn in, we're bored during COVID, not much to do. Our eyes are going places, perhaps they shouldn't be going. And those colours those colours that God has painted his masterpiece with are being darkened, made grey. You're not feeling that vibrant. You're not feeling that alive. Well, maybe it's time for you to position yourself for the water of God to come and cleanse you, cleanse you of the pollution of the world, cleanse you of religious performance awaken and refresh you and pour out His Spirit so the vibrancy of the masterpiece of your life can be put on display. 
Because God did not create you to sit on a shelf and be hidden. God did not create you to be covered in dust, stagnant and passive. God created you to arise and shine for His light to be seen upon you. The book of Isaiah is prophetically very clear over the people of God. And it speaks to us today as much as it spoke to the Israelites. Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. There it is. God's people are the answer. The answer. As darkness increased upon the earth, God's glory shone upon the people. But they had to arise. They had to arise, the Amplified Bible says, arise out of the depression and prostration of circumstances. Circumstances leave us depressed and flat. Is anyone with me or is it just me? Can I get a show of hands? Lena, thank you. That's one, two, three, four. Yes, I am not alone. Circumstances are just depressing because we're not meant to be ruled by circumstances. We're not meant to be ruled by what's happened to us, what someone did to us last week, the challenges we're facing. Imagine if we made the problems our Lord. In fact, I just wonder if we do. We'd go nowhere. We'd do nothing. We lay prostrate. How about if we make Jesus our Lord? How about if we make Jesus bigger than our problems? How about if we make him enormous? And our problems, minuscule, arise out of the depression and the prostration of circumstances. Isaiah 52, awake, awake, Zion. That's you and I, God's people. Clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, Jerusalem, the holy city. The uncircumcised and the defiled will not enter you again. Shake off your dust, masterpiece. Shake off your dust, masterpiece of God. Sit in throne, rise up, sit in throne, Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains on your neck, daughter Zion. There it is again, awake. Shake off the dust. Shake off what's happening around you. Shake off the past disappointments. Shake off the rejections. To be God's answer to be God's masterpiece in a world desperate for answers, desperate for people of strength, desperate for people of courage, desperate for people of cope. We're gonna have to do some rising, some shining and some shaking. We're gonna have to pull ourselves up out of depression of circumstances. We're going to have to shine and believe that God, we are who God says we are not because of how good we did yesterday, not because of how many people we got saved, not because of the good works, but because he says we are his masterpiece. We are who he says we are. We're gonna have to do some shining and we're gonna have to do some shaking. We're gonna have to shake off the dust. The dust represents the challenges of everyday life. It represents the disappointments of yesterday's assignment. Jesus said to his disciples, you know, he said, if you go to one house and they reject you, if your ministry doesn't work out in this particular field, shake off the dust and on you go, move on and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. I just wonder if his disciples would be ineffective preaching the gospel if they hadn't shaken off the dust from their failures, from the places they were rejected. We need to shake off the dust from those places and we need to move forward, believing that we are who God says we are. Okay, point four. We are created for good works. No matter what you've spent the past 10, 20 years doing, no matter what you've spent yesterday doing, from this point, actually from the moment you yield your life to Christ, You are created 
for good works. Now, you don't have to fret and say, well, what is my good work? What is my purpose? Because the Word of God is very clear. We are created for good works that God has prepared beforehand that we would simply walk in them. Okay, do you know what my good work was yesterday? It's as simple as this. I turned up to Elijah's rugby game. My youngest son is the first rugby league player in my home. I actually think it's quite fun. The grandmother's freaking out. Dad's kind of into it. Elijah is passionate about it. It's like the one legitimate place that tackles and rumbles can happen without mum shouting at him. So Elijah is super passionate about playing rugby and I kind of think it's fun that he's into it and he loves it. And so I turned up to the rugby game and I I met a mum there. And she had one of her gorgeous boys was playing in Elijah's team and we just started chatting and she was a single mum, dad's in jail, raising the kids on her own, been through horrific domestic violence. And um, my good work was just listen, chat and encourage. I didn't plan that. I didn't think, gee, I really want to work with, you know, women who have been through domestic violence, which by the way, I do think is an incredible thing to do. I think God is, God's heart and hand is towards the afflicted and he's gonna raise them up as a mighty force in the days we live in. But I wasn't thinking that. I was just walking, walking out my day and boom, I collide with a walk. That's a little example. It's simple things. It's getting up and serving your family. It's putting on your best attitude as an employee. It's walking in the good works that God has already prepared for you. In our church, moving into vision builders is a corporate good work that God has prepared for us as a church. It's no coincidence that you're sitting here. These days were ordained by God. You're here for a purpose. He has a plan. You're part of it. And as we corporately engage in vision builders in giving our time, our talent and money to the building of God's house, that is a great work that God puts right in front of our face that we simply walk in. Vision builders is a great walk at work. I remember as a young girl in my early 20s and I started to feel God calling me and I had no idea what it meant. I signed up for online Bible college and then I kind of realised that I needed to be in the body of Christ and I joined a church and things started to piece together and then I found myself in the Vision Builders campaign of that church and I just thought, awesome. I was a student, I hardly had any money, but I just got involved. I thought this is a good work. God's put before me. I'm here. I'm part of this body. I'm part of this church. I just get involved. And so I committed. And then I think it was the next vision builders. I think I sat with Tim at the dinner. We weren't really going out, but you know, someone put us together. There was a vision builder set up. They put us on the same table together. And so, you know, maybe that's why Tim's so passionate about vision builders. (laughs) Just saying, maybe that's like God's psychology in it all. (laughs) And so, you know, but it was just a good work. I just got involved. It was in front of my face. And, you know, and it really brings me to the final point of this message. That yes, individually, we are God's masterpiece. But the passion of Christ is the church. It's His bride. His ultimate masterpiece is the body of Christ, formed together, moving together, fitted together, placed together, working in harmony, displaying His love, displaying His compassion, and displaying His grace to the world around us. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. I remember Pastor Mark Kelsey used to always say that at Bible College over at Oxford Falls. There's no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. And it's because of Christ's passion for His body. He's passionate about the body of Christ. We're not meant to do it alone. I tried. I tried doing correspondence Bible College and becoming a minister all on my own. It was a disaster. I needed to be fitted into the family of God. 
the blood flows through the body. The healing blood of Jesus flows through His body, through His church. We grow through the body of Christ. Ephesians 2.10, same chapter as our keynote scripture, just further on in the chapter. Reading from the NIV, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole body is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by His Spirit. The message puts it plainly. The message says it's plain enough. You're not wandering exiles. You're not wandering around on your own. This kingdom of faith is your home country. You're no longer strangers. You're not an outsider. I'm speaking that over you today. I don't care how you feel. The Word, I do, I do, I do care how you feel. But the Word, the Word is more important. The Word is paramount. You are no longer an outsider. You belong here. You belong in the family of God with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home. Yes, He is with all our broken, crazy pieces. He's using us all irrespective of how we got here in what He is building. He used the apostles and prophets for the foundation and now He's using you, masterpiece. He's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home, His masterpiece, the church. It goes on in the next chapter of Ephesians in chapter 3. And we read that it was God's intent, verse 10, that now through the church, the corporate body of believers fitted together working together, that the manifold, many colours of wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. In the days that we're living in, there is great spiritual warfare upon the earth. There's a great spiritual battle between light and dark, between truth and compromise. And it's God's intent that His church his body, built together, fitted together, flowing together like a beautiful choreography of dance would actually make known the wisdom of God, the power of God, that His church would be the answer, the local church formed together, the corporate church formed together. His church is the answer. And that is why we are unapologetic about vision builders. That is why year after year, we come to this same altar moment where together we give towards the work of God in and through His church. We give towards buildings, towards purchasing a facility in the city where the people can gather and worship and grow and be discipled and the blood of Christ can flow through His body, bringing healing and bringing transformation and bringing hope where there's been despair and death and ashes. That is why we give to C3 Cares where the message of the Gospel is preached not just in word, but in action, through food going right throughout our state now right throughout New South Wales, locally and out in the country, we preach the Gospel through giving to those that are struggling. That is why we continue to give towards media facilities and equipment that people will remember 
what God says and our brokenness would be healed and hope would be proclaimed and the Gospel would be broadcast throughout the earth. Can I ask that we all stand? I just want to finish with a story and it's from the life of Vincent van Gogh, actually. Some of you may have seen a recent movie made about his life. It's an incredible movie. And, you know, he was declared insane as he brought forth great art upon the earth. And there was a moment in an insane asylum where a minister approached Van Gogh and he had his paintings there. And the minister said, you can't honestly believe that God has given you this gift. You can't honestly believe that your paintings are gifted, that this is something from God. And Van Gogh said, what if my paintings are for a people that are not yet born? And one of the characteristics towards being a masterpiece in the Kingdom of God and giving into the church, giving our time, giving our talent, giving our treasure into the house of God is we are continually creating and building for a people who are not yet born. We are continually creating and building that the church may arise in uncertain times that our children would come to a place of shelter and hope where the Gospel is preached. You know, I never knew 20 years ago when I gave in to my first Vision Builders, that little Bethany, you know Bethany, she's in isolation at the moment, she's just back from Victoria. Beautiful Bethany in our church that's been doing the media. Little did I know that beautiful Bethany was in her mother's womb. Literally, as I began my first Vision Builders campaign. And that 20 years later, from homelessness and mental illness and addiction and great brokenness, the Lord would make a place for her to be brought in as a princess, regrafted into the family of God. Hey, B, if you're watching, hope you don't mind me using your story. Regrafted into the family of God, reminded, remembered who she is in Christ. What we're creating here at C3 City, yes, it's for who we are here. It's for the people here, but it's also, it's for the future. It's for those not yet born. It's for something beyond us. And there's nothing greater that we can give our lives towards. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. Help us to remember the privilege of being a part of your church, of being a recreated people, knitted together for the display of your splendour, knitted together to proclaim the good news of the gospel upon the earth. God, so often we can focus on the challenges and the problems and God, we, we repent and we pray, God, that you would remind us of the great joy and privilege of being part of your church upon the earth. Wake us up to the masterpiece inside each one of us and wake us up to the masterpiece of your church. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.